Morning, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Very much appreciate it. I would be remiss if I jumped into my talk without taking a moment to express my gratitude for everything that you and your colleagues do. I do healthcare for a living, but I don't get to touch patients. You put yourselves in harm's way every day so that our families and communities can be safe. And so I feel very fortunate to be up here, to have a chance to work with some of you on a day-to-day -day basis, and to be able to address you today. Like most of you, I imagine that you're not from here. So in my case, I'm from Denver. I took the long way around to get to DC, came through Salt Lake City, and so the good or the bad about having one of these long trips is you get to know your neighbor pretty well. So I got to know my neighbor, and he fortunately he was a pretty cool guy. He flew planes since he was 16. He flew a fighter in combat, and now he's an aerospace engineer, so a real rocket scientist. So for whatever reason, we got on the topic of health care reform. This is a little surprising, because this isn't the kind of stuff that gets you invited to parties, usually. But he had an interest. The more we talked about it, the more he kept shaking his head. So I said, you know, come on, this isn't like flying a fighter plane. He said, you know what, that's easy. You always know which way is up. I have no idea how you're going to figure this whole thing out. Well, the you is all of us. And today is a small step in helping us figure it out. If you're confused, consider yourself in good company, at least in the company of a rocket scientist. There's a flood of predictions that are out there about how this is going to change healthcare. Reality, no one knows for sure. They're just all predictions at this point. What we do know is what's written in the law. And what's written in the law is going to set off a flood of change unlike we've seen for 45 years, maybe ever. And so what I'd like to do today is not talk about everything about healthcare reform. That would be boiling the ocean. But I do want to talk about the things that are most meaningful to you. As business people, as stewards for your benefit plan, and as advisors for your colleagues. What I want you to have is a basic understanding of what the key pieces are of health reform, what the impact is going to be on employers, what the pressures and trade-offs are that they face, because those are the things that are going to impact you, and probably most importantly, give you a feel for what kinds of questions you need to ask so that you could be more in the driver's seat of guiding the direction of your programs. So the one thing that I want you to take away is you can't just have a wait and see approach. We're on the cusp of this change. The biggest wave of health reform is going to occur January 1st, 2014, and it's going to accelerate after that. If you've managed things based on a renewal or a negotiating cycle where you simply decide what kind of premium share you're going to have, your employer's going to have, you need to move away from that. You actually need to have enough of an understanding, know what questions to ask, so that you actually become part of the conversation steering the directions of your health plan. If you don't, maybe nothing bad will happen. But the question is, do you want to leave that to chance? So I want to start off and give you a feel for what's going on in the healthcare market. This is really just to set the stage for the types of things that are going on, because health reform in itself doesn't create markets for the most part, maybe a little bit with exchanges, and we'll talk about that later. But it changes all of the things that we have going on with this $2.8 trillion system that we have in healthcare. So this isn't going to be a surprise, right? Premiums have been going up. Over the past 10 years, they've effectively doubled. In this case, for a family, the average contribution is approaching $4,500. If you look at individuals, and in this case, the share of family coverage has stayed pretty steady, workers' contribution. For individuals, it's actually crept up. 
So individuals are being asked to pay more every year. From 2002 to 2012, it's gone up from about 14% to 18%. But that's not all. We know that during this whole time, benefit plans have been changing. So the amount that you pay out of pocket for health care, along with rising health care costs, have also gone up. The reason it's meaningful, even though it's not a surprise, is the pressure that creates. If you're on a budget basis, if you're on a fixed revenue stream, even if you're out in general industry, you have to figure out how to manage this because it's gone up well in excess of CPI. Now the good news is there was a report released at the beginning part of this year about national health, health expenditures, how much we spend as a country. That amount actually was the lowest that we've had in about 50 years. Very positive thing. A lot of it, though, was due to the economy. People suppress utilization, don't get the services that they may need, things that they could put off, because they're worried about what may happen, all the things that are going in around them. You see the unemployment reports, things of that nature. You're a little bit more cautious with your money. And we haven't seen what kind of impact health reform may have. It may work to suppress costs. In the short term, though, it's going to add a little bit more pressure to the cost curve. Coming out of the economy, we actually can expect things to tick up a little bit. Now, along the way, we have this phenomenon called consumer-directed health plans that I'm sure you've all heard of. This is where the individual has more financial responsibility in paying for their services. Could be a good thing, could be a bad thing, depending on how it's used. But that, in part, also has pushed down some trends. Now that was the broader view. The question is, what does that mean for employer plans? Well, at this point, trends are still a fair amount higher than national health care expenditures. Coming into 2013, we're looking at about 7.5% average trends. This is across the country. You may live in a higher cost area, lower cost area. And coming into 2014, Things should stay about the same. Now, the good news is we've come off of many years of close to double-digit rate increase trends. That, that's a pretty tough pill to swallow. So coming down is a good thing, but it's still many multiples of what we're seeing is CPI. And now we have health care reform, these big sweeping changes coming up, the biggest of which is, again, in 2014. Initially, and unfortunately, it will add costs. From an employer perspective, it's going to require more benefits to be covered, which for workers is great. You get more of the services that you need, things like preventive care, no annual limits. There's also going to be some fees, some taxes to fund some necessary programs. But then what happens beyond that is a big question. Health reform may mitigate costs. We're just going to have to wait and see. But there's some very positive things in the law about how providers are reimbursed, about encouraging new models of care, and the biggest piece of all is getting more people covered. There's a big cost shift that occurs between government programs and the commercial sector, the programs that you're covered under, that causes the commercial side to pay quite a bit more. And so as that is leveled by bringing more insureds into the market, then hopefully premiums will stabilize as well. But that's not going to happen in 2014, likely not in 2015. But as we get a little bit further out, hopefully things will start to rebalance a little bit. So beyond that, there's some other things that are going on in the healthcare marketplace. You don't need to be experts in this, but you need to know that these are happening because these are the things that employers see. These are the things that they react to and that they're going to base some of their decisions off of. We have this big wave of consolidation, this race for scale, hospitals acquiring other hospitals, insurers acquiring hospitals, provider practices being bought up. So who knows, out of that could come some efficiencies or could come more oligopolies. We also have these new care delivery methods coming out. These are where, for example, primary care docs are more the quarterbacks of all of our care. Great thing. Some of it is a little bit of a flashback to the old managed care days, but I'd argue done a lot better. Right incentives, right information, better models of care, more quality. 
We also have this movement away from choose any doctor you want. Right now we have these broad networks. What comes along with picking sides is having to make trade-offs. Do I want to go to this narrow group of doctors or that narrow group of doctors? It's great to have choice, but in this push to manage costs, everyone's looking for different ways to do so by steering more volume to hopefully better doctors. Individuals are also expected to have a much greater role. It's not just here's your benefit plan, do with it what you will, but now you have to be more active consumers, hopefully enabled with more price information, but also taking on more financial responsibility. If people get the tools to do that, great. It should work well. If not, it could be a big mess. We know that a lot of drugs are coming off patent. That lowers the cost in some cases. The flip side of it is we have a lot of specialty meds, what are called biologics, genetically engineered drugs. Great things, life-saving drugs, but the cost of a script may go from a few hundred bucks to a few thousand, tens of thousands of dollars. And we all need to figure out a way to pay for it. And along the same lines, amazing new technologies, new advances are coming out. But with the loss of annual limits, it also pushes up the cost of care. Coming off of the economic downturn that we've had, utilization is going to continue to pick up. And last I checked, we're all getting a year older every year. So you put all these together, and I hope you see there's both things that are causing downward pressure on costs and things that are causing upward pressure on costs. And so that's why this is so uncertain. But the progress of change at this point is unstoppable. So along comes health care reform. We're already well underway. Everyone's been implementing all the pieces of reform, but the biggest piece is yet to come. In the middle of 2013, we have this list of things that everyone's required to do, hopefully should have been done. Some of these I'll cover in a little bit more detail so that you're familiar with them. 2013 is largely about administrative mandates benefit mandates, things of the like. There's some taxes on some industry sectors that have come into play, but smaller piece of the overall pie. Then comes along 2014. Things that you likely heard of, the pay or play penalty. This is the employer shared responsibility requirement. The individual mandate requirement for all of us to have coverage. Things like exchanges, more types of taxes, other types of benefit limitations. This is where the magic happens. So in 2014 is going to be the beginning of when the marketplace changes really to respond to all of these things. And then it continues on, not only dealing with the things that have happened in 2014 and before, but also new things. The ability for large employers to enter into exchanges comes in 2017. What you've heard referred to as the Cadillac tax, the Maserati tax, whatever car it is, comes in 2018 as well. So I'll get into some of these just to make sure that you have a basic understanding. But if you look at this broadly, you take a step back. It's like assembling pieces of a puzzle. You could divide it up into five parts. First is benefit and administrative mandates. These are things that are pretty much check the box. It's written in the law in a particular way. Don't have a choice. This is really what you need to do. Then you have three pieces that work in concert with one another. The employer pay or play mandate, which is also called the shared responsibility requirement. The individual mandate. And then health insurance exchanges, all coming up in 2014. And then lastly, that tax in 2018. My intent is to break down each of the pieces for you, give you a high-level overview of each, but probably most importantly, give you a feel for what are the questions that you need to ask. Again, with the goal of got to peel the onion so that you can know what's underneath, and then you could steer the conversations when you get back home. So let's start with the benefit and administrative mandates. All of these things are already in motion. W-2 reporting, these are things that are reported on your W-2 health plan values. How much is being paid for coverage? The most important part of that is at this point, 
It's a reporting requirement. Healthcare is not taxable. The first thing that people think when they see it on their W-2s, am I being taxed on this? Still a pretty common myth. Well, it's not. There's some disclosures like summaries of benefit coverage that need to be put out, some limitations on contributions to flexible spending accounts. The wave of preventive care benefits is going to continue forever because that's how the law is built in. As more preventive care requirements come out, they'll just be baked into your benefit plans. A great thing on one hand, but something that does put a little bit of cost pressure on there. And some employer obligations to do withholds for Medicare taxes and some additional reporting about exchanges. Those have been put off till the tail end of the year. But just as a side note, there's what's required to be put out and there's the opportunity that you have to communicate to your membership. Make sure it's not just checking the box for what's required with the model language, that you take the opportunity to inform people of the messages that you want them to hear about exchanges, about the trade-offs that you need to make. That's going to have to occur around the fall of this year. Great timing for you to be proactive. Then we have some more benefit mandates in 2014 can't have a waiting period more than 90 days. If someone's waiting for six months a year to get coverage, that's going to have to be scaled back. No dollar limits on care. Great thing on one hand. On the flip side, particularly if you're self-funded, also affects your stop-loss coverage. There's this thing called minimum essential coverage that I'll talk to a little bit more. But that's the obligation for an employer to provide it also an individual to have it, whether through his or her employer or not. And some other reporting requirements. There's this thing called auto-enrollment that was going to be effective in 1114, where each individual automatically gets opted into their health benefit plan and then has to choose to proactively opt out rather than what we do right now, which is I have to make an election. That's going to change things quite a bit. Great point to communicate as well, but we don't have an effective date yet. And then both in 2013 and 2014, there's a wave of different types of taxes and fees. Again, going to fund some important programs, but at the same time, from an employer perspective, these are things that add cost to the benefit plan, things that you need to know about. This comparative effectiveness fee, which is a dollar per belly button, man, woman, and child, covered under your benefit plan, moving to $2. A reinsurance fee that helps fund reinsurance in the exchanges. This is going to be a three-year fee applicable to fully insured and self-funded plans. Probably is going to add about 2 and a quarter percent to your costs. For those that are fully insured, there's also excise taxes on insurers that are likely going to be passed through to you. And then underneath that, there's some other taxes on the pharmaceutical industry and the medical device industry. May or may not come through in your medical costs. We'll have to see. So the questions that you should be asking. Benefit mandates are pretty straightforward. But have you actually assessed how taxes and fees are going to assess your 2014 costs? You'll have to do it differently for fully insured plans versus self-funded. Also, what benefit changes are being considered for 2014? If some of you are grandfathered, I can tell you a lot of employers are looking at dropping their grandfathered status for 2014. And that in itself, not that they have to, they can keep it forever if they choose to. It's becoming increasingly tough, and 2014 seems to be the year that most employers are considering doing it. The next piece is employer shared responsibility. That's changed the game from having benefits just be a form of compensation to now employers being in the healthcare financing game whether they like it or not. I imagine in all of your cases, benefits are just a part of the mix. That's not true everywhere in the country. And so if anyone's considered making a change, it's not just as easy as dropping coverage anymore because they're financing it, whether it's through paying for benefits or paying this penalty. But it's important for you to know what kind of trade-offs they're going to be making so that at least you can have a feel for how they're doing the math and be able to ask the questions. There's a few things I want to clarify just to find for you. 
The first thing is just the requirement. At the very basic level, an employer is required to offer what's called minimum essential coverage to at least 95% of FTEs. There's a specific definition for FTE that I'll circle back to. If you don't do that, you get what I'll call the nuclear penalty. You have to pay 2,000 bucks, non-tax deductible, per head across your entire population. If you offer coverage to 90% of your people, doesn't mean they have to take it, but 90%, they get the penalty across every single one of their FTEs. Now this minimum essential coverage, I'll talk about in a little bit, but it's some very basic level of coverage. If you have any benefits at all, I'm sure you satisfy it. A few other things up here means that kids have to get coverage, be offered coverage as well. Interestingly, don't ask me why, spouses don't. Someone didn't like their spouse when they crafted that. It also means that you could arbitrarily exclude 5% of your workforce. No particular reason. Requirement is 95%. So the question is, are employers going to exclude any of that? Let's say you've checked the box for that first piece. Then you move on, and you have to offer what I'll call qualifying and affordable coverage. It's really minimum value and affordable coverage. So this basic level of coverage that's worth about 60%, if you do that, then you offer this qualifying and affordable, then no one, you can't be subject to a penalty, this $3,000 tier two penalty for any person that gets subsidized coverage through the exchange. The flip side to that is, none of your people can go out to exchanges and get subsidies anymore because they've been offered qualifying or minimum value and affordable coverage by their employer. I'll come back to that because that's important. You may want some of your people. Some people may be better off going out to the exchanges and getting subsidies. So the employer is going to be weighing, am I subject to tier one? That's usually something everyone wants to stay away from. I can tell you I don't have a single client that is looking at dropping coverage. But I have had some say, you know, I may not be the first, but I may be the second. I need to see how things go. It'll be very interesting to see how it plays out. Do have some considering the trade-offs between tier two, because this isn't on everyone. It's just for the people that get subsidized coverage through the exchange, and so it becomes a real option for employers. So let me clarify for you these terms that I keep throwing out, what qualifying means and what affordable means. Assuming that you've offered some basic level of coverage, this minimum essential coverage, at this point, it actually hasn't been clearly defined. But I'll tell you, it's something like if you're going out to dinner, it's the equivalent of one slice of cheese pizza. It's enough to get your appetite going, maybe put something in your stomach, but really not enough to fill you up. The next level, is qualifying or minimum value coverage. This is basically means the coverage pays 60 cents out of every dollar of services that are incurred for healthcare. Usually, coverage tends to be more at that 80% level. So it doesn't require that you only offer 60% coverage. This is just the floor to get out of that tier two penalty. And then the other part is affordability. Forget about what you and I term as affordable just for our day-to-day -day lives. In the law, it's 9.5% of W-2 income. That gets the employer out of paying any penalty. If either one of these is triggered, employer doesn't get a penalty, they may be subject to one. If that if each affected individual goes out and gets a subsidy on the exchanges. So the question that you need to ask it's really just digging into the details again about all these. At what level is each of our plans? How do we compare to that qualifying or minimum value level? Are there any changes that are planned? Introducing new plans, bringing us further down the spectrum? How many people have unaffordable coverage? 
And will, it be any, will there be any employees excluded from coverage, that 95% requirement where people can, employers can exclude 5%? Now what I want you to be thinking about, because we'll talk about this more when I come to exchanges and subsidies, is it's not necessarily a bad thing to have one of these triggers tripped. Because again, some of your people may be better off going to the exchanges, getting the subsidy, because it's going to be more than what the employer provides. And the employer's OK paying the penalty. But unless you ask them, you'll never know. So the other big piece is I've talked about applicability of the law to full-time employees. The law for benefit purposes has defined full-time employees. So before, it was solely between the individual and his or her employee and how you wanted to figure it out. Now, for benefit purposes, there's a pretty strict definition. It's those that work 30 hours a week on average over a certain measurement period. I'm not going to get into the details of measurement. It's pretty ugly, probably put all of you to sleep. But if people aren't working on an hourly basis or they're pseudo hourly, but their time is counted in different ways, it becomes a real challenge, figuring out how your employer is going to count it and to determine whether you're required or considered an FTE and required to be offered benefits. You get that three-month pass that I mentioned before, the 90-day waiting period. And there's this other bucket. What the law essentially says is now you're either a full-time employee or you're a variable hour employee, which means we're going to figure out whether you're a full-time employee period by period every year or some other period that the employer chooses. We're going to measure every person that falls into that other bucket. And then we're going to figure it out. That means that people could be considered full-time one period, not full-time another period. It also means if people are working multiple jobs, their hours are no longer based on each separate job that they work. You're looking at the person as a whole, looking at their hours across jobs. What that may mean for an employer is restructuring the way that jobs are offered to individuals, whether people are allowed to work across multiple jobs. There's also a requirement that, not a requirement, the ability to exclude seasonal employees, those that are just hired on for specific peak periods. If you have some of those, the question is, what happens to them? Are they offered coverage or are they not offered coverage? And then same thing for new employees. The employer is going to have to make a determination when someone is hired. Are you considered full-time for purposes of benefits in the law? Or are you in this other bucket and we're going to put it off? And in that case, they could wait for pretty much a year before figuring it out. So the questions that you should be asking or how many people are considered FTEs? Who are, who aren't? Are there positions that are going to be restructured? Are there hours that are going to be restructured? What employers are standing back thinking is, wow, my enrollment is going to increase. Every person that comes on my plan costs me a fair amount of extra money. How do I deal with that added cost, particularly if I'm on a fixed budget? Do I lower benefits? Do I eliminate positions? Do I restructure my workforce somehow? So those are all questions that you need to know up front. Hear about what they're thinking. How are they going to track hours, particularly if you have people that aren't on a true hourly basis? Whether they're working multiple jobs, those that are auxiliary. And then how are the notifications going to occur? Because there's this back and forth between measurement, extending an offer of coverage, accepting an offer of coverage, and this rolling cycle that occurs over and over again, it's going to be a little bit different than what you've traditionally seen that affects your people. This is why things are a big deal. Now, I recognize I've gone well beyond your sector, but all employers are experiencing some level of cost increase. Benefit mandates, some of these requirements 
may add just a few percentage points to their cost. But in some cases, particularly those industries that don't cover a lot of workers or just don't have workers that take up the offer of coverage, their costs can double. I've seen some even more than that. I have companies where their entire earnings for the year can be wiped out in 2014 if they keep things status quo. And so this is a big deal to employers. The biggest driver usually is those added belly buttons and the costs that additional people have. Like I mentioned, every employer to some extent is looking at what the cost is of dropping their plan. Doesn't mean they're gonna do so, but they wanna be able to answer the question. Now I can terminate coverage. Well, heck, they could terminate coverage right now in a lot of cases, putting aside bargained arrangements, but they haven't. So that's why a lot of them will choose to continue as they have going forward. But with rare exception, an employer would save money by dropping their coverage and just paying the penalty. The one thing it doesn't consider is how do you make people whole for what you've just taken away from them? How do you gross up compensation? And so what happens then is the equation flips on its head. There's almost not a time where if you take both the cost of dropping coverage and what it would take to make people whole that it works to an employer's favor to drop it. That's why at this point everyone's taking a wait and see approach. And to make things worse for the most part when you do the winners and losers on an individual basis who's going to be better off who's going to be worse off for the most part employers will be employees will be worse off if the employer drops coverage but even then there's exceptions coming back to what I said before the numbers play out person by person doesn't matter what happens across the entire plan. So one of the things that you should be aware of is what are the strategies that employers are considering? I was pretty broad here. Not all of these are going to be applicable. But it's important that you know about the types of things that they're thinking about when they're faced with these kinds of numbers. There's two broad buckets of strategies. One is what are they doing with their workforce? The other is what are they doing with their benefit plan specifically? Both of these things combine then to affect your colleagues. All of those things related to position structure, who they offer hours to, how many hours are worked, who's considered full-time, not full-time. Do we reduce the number of full-time positions, go to more part-time positions, for example? Do we give more hours to some people, few hours to other people? Because of the cost of benefits these days, about 20% of overall compensation, sometimes more. There's a lot of money that's at stake here. The other side of it is what do we do with our benefits? Do we continue to cost shift? So put more pressure on individuals and their families by reducing benefits, by making them pay more out of pocket. Do we change who we cover, how we cover them? I mentioned spouses don't need to be covered. That could change. How much is paid for spouse coverage? How much is paid for child coverage? What if the spouse has access to other coverage through his or her employer? Asking them to pay more. This in-between approach of you don't have to be completely in benefits, completely out of benefits. You push some people to the exchange because legitimately it could be better off for them is a strategy that some are looking at. And some are looking at using the wellness surcharge differently. Now this could work to your advantage actually because Firefighters, for the most part, are a heck of a lot better risk, lower cost than most out there. And so they say, well, there's an extra surcharge if you don't check all the boxes for whatever wellness program we have. That surcharge may allow someone to go out to the exchange and get subsidized coverage and be better off. So not everything being considered here is necessarily a bad thing. It's all how it's being used. The questions that you should be asking about all this is, have you done the math? Have you modeled this provision by provision so that you understand what is impacting you as an employer from health care reform? If you haven't, you're just guessing, and you could be making some pretty big changes 
decisions based on <coughs> speculative information. What are the pieces driving the change? What are you assuming? Is it really the benefit mandates? Some of these fees? Is it adding additional covered people? How are you looking at the people that we cover? Like with any modeling, you're making a lot of assumptions. What are you assuming when you're doing the modeling? What discussions have been had about pay or play, or even an in-between, a hybrid strategy? And when you get that cost picture, stepping back and saying, how are you thinking about cost management? What steps are you looking at? Even if you're on a bargaining cycle, at some point you're coming off that cycle and knowing what the employer's view is when you come into it is pretty important. So now we get around to your and my responsibility in 2014. Every American's gonna be required to have some basic level of coverage. That basic level is the same requirement as for the employer, what's called minimum essential coverage. Really, if you buy any product on the marketplace, you're gonna check the box. There's other ways to do that as well, and I'll talk about those in a second. But if you're offering any kind of employer-sponsored plan, the people that choose the plan are gonna be good. If an individual chooses not to obtain any coverage, you pay a penalty. You either pay a dollar amount or you pay a percent of income. Realistically, everyone's gonna pay a percent of income if they have to pay the penalty because it's the greater of. So you'd have to be making a salary of $9,500 a year to pay the dollar amount, the 1%. Penalty keeps going up. There's gonna be some people that make the trade off and say, you know, for paying 95 bucks, I'm just willing to go without. But there's a lot of them that are going to choose to come into the benefit program if they haven't before, whether th through themselves or their spouses. Overall, we expect about 30 million of new insureds to come in. Great thing for them, and hopefully a great thing, and that'll take some cost pressure off of the providers and then circle back to all of our benefit plans. Now the employer isn't the only option that individuals can choose. Really, if you get coverage through any source, you've checked that box. If you go through any form of government program, you could go out and buy coverage on your own, get coverage through your spouse, if you're under 26, through mom and dad. Or you can go out to the exchange these are the things that are coming up in 2014. So let me give you an overview of what these things are. They've actually been renamed. No longer called exchanges, they're called marketplaces. And that's exactly what they are. If you've ever been out to Amazon.com, any shopping website, that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to create a marketplace for people to be able to purchase insurance, and to get information that allows them to make better decisions. Exchanges are gonna have navigators that help them figure out how to make those trade-offs within the exchanges. They won't help them make trade-offs between your plan and the exchanges, but they will within the exchange. There's nothing that requires someone to go to an exchange. You'll still have an individual market, you'll still have a small group market out there. But this is a new marketplace that's coming out. It hasn't existed for the most part before could be run by the government or there could be a separate nonprofit set up. The state where I'm from, Colorado, we have a separate public entity, quasi-governmental, that's set up that's gonna manage the exchange for us. And they're gonna do all the lifting around creating the IT behind it and getting the navigators on board and making sure that we have this marketplace set up for, by January 1st, 2014. Question I get often asked is, so with all this work that's required to get these up, are they gonna be put off? No, they're not. I think there's a very clear mandate from the administration that these be up and operational by January 1st. Now I can tell you in all likelihood, it's gonna be messy. We're talking about developing a new marketplace, first time ever that this kind of thing has been put in place. So you have to be a little bit patient. 
There's going to be a separate marketplace for small groups as well called shop exchanges. Could be for groups up to 50, could be for groups up to 100. Until 2016, it's a state by state decision, and then it'll have to be 100. And then states in 2017 can choose to have large group exchanges as well. Whether they do so or not, it'll be up to the states. But access to this new marketplace will be a change. So then the other question is, how are these going to be run? Right now, you have 17 states that are going to do it on their own. You have about seven that are going to be in a, what's called a partnership model. They're going to set up some of the rules, and the feds are going to provide some of the back office work. And then the rest are going to be in a federal model. Practically, for an individual, I'll tell you it doesn't matter. If you're interested in public policy, this is something that you can influence at the state level of how your state gets involved. But what it looks like to an individual should be pretty comparable. So now the question is, well, how much are things going to cost? Before you start looking at the numbers, I'll tell you no one knows. There's been projections done by a nonpartisan nonprofit group called the Kaiser Family Foundation that estimates by high and low cost areas what different benefit plans are going to cost. But the reality is you're going to have all these health plans that are coming in and playing in these marketplaces. The Anthems and Cygnus and Uniteds and Kaisers all coming in. They're all going to have slightly different benefit plans. Should be comparable. Different rates. They're going to vary by age. Going to vary by area. And so as we get closer to October 1st, when these things really go up live and you're going to be able to see they're going to start marketing, you're not going to know. But people are going to need to make trade-offs about which path do I go? What's better for me? The projections for different areas of the country for a 40-year-old are up here. And the way the plans are going to be structured are around the metals, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, just different levels of benefit coverage. One tool that I mentioned that's at the bottom of the page is you could actually plug in and get estimates of what exchange, rate, exchange rates are expected to be for particular areas as best we know it if you go out to this calculator at the bottom of the slide. At this point, though, it's good to get yourself familiar with what the tools out there, what the numbers are saying, because I can tell you as advisors of your colleagues, they're going to be coming to you and saying, what do I do? And being able to steer them is going to be one of the things that hopefully you'll be able to come closer to October 1st. What you should also be talking to your employer about is, you know that financial modeling I talked about? Well, they have the wage information for all of your people. They should be able to go out and say, how many people are eligible for subsidies? Take a look at W-2 income, do the math. Subsidies go up to 400% of poverty level. They know what the contribution is for their benefit plans. Who are the winners and who are the losers? Who are going to be the people that are better off going to the exchanges than staying on their benefit plan? And then that becomes a discussion point for you. Do you want to make sure to structure their coverage, their contributions in such a way where you use the federal subsidies for these people? The employer doesn't have to pay the contribution. Overall, it becomes a win-win. But again, it's person by person. And unless you do the math, pretty hard to figure out. The last piece is this Cadillac tax in 2018. Every benefit plan, this is not your overall benefit program, but this is benefit by benefit. Everyone that triggers certain dollar thresholds that have been set up, hard-coded into the law, will pay a tax of 40% of the excess. The good news is there's an adjustment for high-risk professions, of which you're one. So you get a little bit higher bump. With all the plans that I deal with, the firefighters tend to be the low, lower cost ones. And so unlikely that they're going to be triggering it in 2018. But keep in mind, this isn't just a 2018 thing. 
it keeps going, and it's only indexed by CPI plus 1%. Most benefit plans run well in excess of that. And so it's usually not a question of if you're going to trigger it. It's a question of when you're going to trigger it. And then the next question is, what are you going to do about it? Because I don't think anyone wants to pay an additional 40% of that excess on their benefit plan. So that chart that you saw on the prior page, this is one of those that's pretty easy to do the math for it. You do some projections. You figure out which benefit by benefit is going to trigger it when. Have to do it by single versus family. So you just ask the question, have you done the math? Where do our benefit plans look compared to the threshold? If we're good for 2018, then when do we flip the trigger? If you have retirees embedded in your plan, that's certainly going to affect the cost. Do you consider peeling them out and dealing with them separately? Or how are they impacting the cost? And then what's the plan when you do hit the trigger? This is a bargaining point, negotiation point. At some point, then you say, I'm willing to take a reduction in benefits and put it into wages instead so that you get out of paying the excise tax, but we're still made whole. But those are things that need to occur well up front. So let me close by talking about a few things for you. Hopefully, this has all been captured as I've been talking through this. The first is the need to be engaged. Everything that I've talked about today, I've just scratched the surface on. There's so much more depth to this that it can make your head spin. But if you don't know how the mechanics work, it becomes pretty easy to do things that you find out about on the back end, make things a little bit uncomfortable for you. You've got to actually look at the numbers, understand what's driving your costs, what's been done to manage the costs. If you need to, you may want to do some audits looking at some opportunities to manage cost. Make sure you keep an eye out of how your state exchanges are coming up. Is it going to be a state-run model, federally-run model? When are rates coming out so that you can inform people and start to make some of those comparisons for them? And then start to evaluate what your options are. Right now, the law is set up that it advantages self-funded plans a little bit more, a little bit less weight on taxes for self-funded plans. What are the options that your people are going to be considering? Exchanges versus their employer plan. And then when you get closer to 2018, have you thought about how to structure your benefit versus compensation mix? And by the way, Talking about the healthcare market, this isn't just about healthcare reform. Now more than ever, you need to be diligent about looking for more efficient purchasing. What kind of provider networks are out there? If you have a financial arrangement through a stop loss plan, how are you structuring your financial arrangement? How do you put the pieces together so that you could have the combination of the best benefits and the best overall spend that you can? There's enough change going on there that if you're not doing that due diligence, you're missing a lot of things that are coming up. And then look at wellness programs and incentives as a positive. Even with this wellness surcharge that can go up to 30% of your premium costs, for some people, it could actually work as a positive again if they go out to the exchanges. But even if they don't, you're just about the healthiest bunch out there. And so using wellness programs, particularly if you're lumped in with a broader municipality's population, to help you get a better deal is important. Probably the most important part is if you step back and you look at this as a collaborative approach to designing your benefits program, you'll be better off. A lot of employers are faced with very tough trade-offs, ones that they may not have chosen to have in front of them, but are there nonetheless. And then on the flip side, hope, thankfully we're coming out of a bad economy. But they may have some lagging budgets trying to figure out how to deal with scarce resources. And so sitting down and understanding these pressures and figuring out strategies together usually helps you end up at a better place than if you would waiting for the renewal to come up, waiting for the bargaining cycle to come up. 
So I hope in covering all of this, it's given you some tools to ask the right questions, some to begin planning, and hopefully to end up better off than you otherwise would have been. So thank you very much for your time.